really, really happy to have you here. You know, it's a privilege for me to be here, but I, I have to tell you, I was worried that no one would show up. <laughs> and so I was worried about embarrassing Senator Hatch, but it is great to be here. I, I love Utah. Uh, I have been to most of your national parks, and uh, there's like no place in the world I'd rather be. This afternoon, I was able to go to one of our stores and meet uh, some of our employees there, and uh, sort of the feeling there, the, the energy there, I think is representative of the larger tech community here. And uh, it is great to be a part of that. You know, there are now over 50,000 registered iOS developers in Utah. I just had the pleasure of meeting some of them backstage, and uh, there are great things happening here. And it's, it is really a pleasure to be a small part of it. And uh, now, I also met some kids earlier, and I hope they're here, uh, from uh, Jack's Elementary. Yes. And uh, Glendale Middle School. We're, we're working with uh, lo local educators on uh, providing iPads and, and, and Macs. And uh, we hope that uh, a lot of kids learn how to code because uh, we really feel strongly that coding should be a required language in, in school. And uh, so we're trying to do our part and uh, we don't do that. So it's great to be here. I know you've got a lot of questions. Let me start off with question number one, then we'll turn to the audience. So what can students do to be competitive in a rapidly changing tech industry? And what attributes or skills do do uh, entry-level employees need to, 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 to develop, in your opinion? Now, this is a really good question. Um, we look, well, obviously we look for wicked smart people, but put that aside for a second. There's a lot of wicked smart people. We look for grit and determination. Uh, we look for people that are curious, uh, because many times you don't really know what to do you're, but you're curious enough to start pulling the string to see where it takes you. And we look for people that are very collaborative because, you know, nobody, even a, somebody that has an S on their chest and a cape on their back can't do everything alone. And so we, we look for people who believe that by working with others, they can amplify what they can do. And, uh, and we look for people that won't accept the status quo. Is that, that people that aren't satisfied with the way things are, that, that really want to change the world and sort of put all of themselves into doing it. And uh, for all of those reasons, it makes Apple a really great place. <laughs> well, there you go, you guys. You know exactly how to get on with Apple. <laughs> <laughs> well, let's turn it over to the audience. And anybody has any questions, uh, how do we do this? Thank you, Senator. Uh, thank you for everyone for submitting questions online. We've picked a few of those today. Our first one today is from uh, Shemi Marshall, a sixth grader and aspiring ballerina. How do you become the CEO of Apple? <laughs> That was an interesting journey. Uh, and it's it hard to live with Steve Jobs, you know. Um, you know, to, to, uh, the, the, the real answer to that is, I always believed in this, um, this old saying from uh, President Lincoln. He used to say, I will prepare and someday my chance will come. And I've always believed that, you know, it's if you have faith that whatever you're doing today, you're not sure necessarily what it will uh, become tomorrow, but eventually if you have faith, something great will happen. And I've always been of that mindset. And so I never dreamed of being a CEO of Apple, is the truth. I never thought it possible. Uh, 
And I, I got the call of a lifetime in 1990, early 1998 from Steve. Um, and I, I decided to talk to him and five minutes into the discussion with him, I wanted to throw caution to the wind and join Apple. And it was the best decision I ever made. Uh, and so, you know, study hard. That's very important. Um, do great work and, and have faith that those things add up and, and will lead you on a journey that is, will be a most incredible journey. That's great. Who's next? Our next question comes from Nate Quigley, CEO of Chatbooks. Thank you. An early iMac user 15 years ago, it was the iMac and iPhoto that changed photography for our family. So I wanted to ask you what the future of capturing and enjoying our memories is, and then how soon the future is here. Yeah, the, the, the future's now a bit. Um, we, it's, I'm, I'm glad you asked this question, because I think photos are one of the most important media uh, of our time and, and, the, and of the future. And so we have, we have placed an unbelievable amount of engineering in making the camera, and not from a spec point of view, because specs or tech specs are uh, not that important in terms of the, the camera. We, we put a lot of effort in integrating the hardware and the software together to produce unbelievable photos. And our, our most recent um, iPhone 7 announcement and, and launch, uh, we now have, an un, it'll take unbelievable photos in low light. You have the ability to zoom. It's amazing that in your pocket, in your pocket, you have a camera that is so much better than the digital, the, the the separate digital camera that you had two years ago, you know? It's unbelievable. It's like what, it's what used to be called pro. It's what used to be, it used to cost tens of thousands of dollars to, to produce the kind of photo. And so I think that's a part of it, but that's not all of it. There's, we have a new um, app called Memories. Has anybody heard of this in here? Yeah, so I'm glad that you've heard of it. But actually, few people have. And they're going to be delighted when they discover it. So it's in the Photos app on your iPhone. And what it does for you on your behalf is take your life as defined by your photos, and it organizes them for you and places music on those. And it's the most incredible feeling when you just open that and see these great memories, you know, if you have kids, it's unbelievable. The, 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 it, it just warms your heart. Uh, maybe it's your vacation, maybe it's your parents, your, your friends, your, your spouse, whoever. Uh, but, but that's the big difference from the iLife days. You were, you were asking about, in there you actually had to do some level of work. And, and, and we tried to make it really simple. And I think at the time it was really great, but now what we've discovered is people's lives are so busy they really don't have time to do it. And, and so through use of AI, we can begin to do unbelievable things for you on your behalf that you can take out and enjoy, and uh, it'll really make your heart sing really well. So the future is now. <laughs> Our next question comes from Chuck Wright, the president of Weber State University. Current encryption methods like SSL are based on a small number of really hard to solve math problems. If and when these are solved, current methods will be useless. What will the next step be in protecting the privacy of digital communications, and can we still have a reasonable expectation to privacy? Yeah, the answer to the last question is uh, yes. You you do if you're an Apple customer. I, I can't I can't say that about everybody. Uh, it's, it's a really good 
question because the encryption is a, uh, think of it as a set of algorithms, very complex math, and all complex things over time are solvable. It's not that encryption can't be solved and can't be broken. It's, and so the question is, if somebody, uh, some sharp mathematician with some uh, really fast computers with great processing speed, could they begin to break encryption? And here's the way we look at that is, one, the longer the key becomes, the more complex it is, even, even with modern supercomputers, it gets incredibly complex. Billions or trillions of times harder the longer that it gets. And so we clearly have that to play with there. The other thing is there's many different kinds of algorithms. And it's unlikely that somebody's going to figure out all of those. And uh, so whether it's uh, you know logarithmic, whether it's elliptical, or or many you know there's so many different types. And so I think between the length and the different algorithms we can throw at it, it's not likely to happen anytime soon. And in the in the meantime, you can bet that we're working as many companies are, I'm sure on finding new ways to make people safer and safer. This is one of the biggest issues that we face, is that uh, I mean, you hear and read in the, in the media about uh, mainly email and photo attacks where, where people are you know, getting pe at people's email and you might hear about credit card attacks. And those are very serious, and now they're affecting hundreds of millions of people in the United States. Uh, but in addition to these, in encryption is what makes us, what makes the public safe as well. I mean, as you know, there are people kept alive because uh, the grid is up. If our grid goes down, if there was a grid attack, the public safety is at risk. If um, you can imagine defense systems need encryption because there are a few bad actors in the world that might like to attack those. And so I, I realize that in some cases encryption has been, some people have tried to make it out to be bad. Encryption is inherently great and uh, we would not be a safe society without it. And uh, so this is an area that is very, very important. Uh, for us, and as you can tell by our actions this year, we throw all of ourselves into this. We're, we, we're very much standing on principle here. Thank you. Our next question comes from Arthur E. B., who is studying chemistry at Westminster College. Uh, what do you think is the most important class you ever took out of all of your education? Calligraphy! <laughs> uh, calligraphy was really important. <laughs> I got a personal uh, lesson from a, from a Chinese uh, calligraphist that was unbelievable. I would say it, it, it changed between high school college, undergrad, grad, and beyond. In, for me, in the formative years, mathematics was very important. Uh, I know, I know, but, but it was important, it was very important, because I wanted to be an engineer. And um, now, at Auburn, the engineering classes were very important, just for the same reason. But what I, what I quickly concluded was, that engineering wasn't sufficient. That there were so many things that should be considered in the most complex problems that you needed a view of, of strategy and of society and, and what society's main issues were so that the engineering would be applied to things that, were, that it should be applied to. And uh, for that reason, I, I took an ethics class and in graduate school. And, you know, business school, you don't really think of business schools and ethics, I guess. Or you should, but, but maybe not so much. But for me, that was a very key, very key class. And then afterwards, in, 
the things for me, the things that have uh, gotten me into the arts and music have been the most important. Because for, for Apple, we believe strongly that uh, the most important things in life stand at the intersection of technology and the liberal arts. And that it's, it's the intersection of those things that, that, uh, that you can do really profound things for, for people that really enrich their lives. And, uh, and so I think, for me at least, it was important to have a broad view of those. And so there's not a simple answer because it changed over, over the course of a lifetime. Does that make sense? I wish I were dressed like you. <laughs> Thank you. I was shocked to see him in a suit. <laughs> Our next question comes from Courtney Reber, and is a UX designer at Exactware. All right. Can we get some business and entrepreneurial advice? With a new product or service, how should we view being first to market versus waiting and observing the industry either succeed or fail before venturing into the same space? I think it's very important to think about uh, three objectives. Being the best, being the first, making the most. Uh, for Apple, being the best is the most important and trumps the other two by far. And however, for other companies, some companies might look at that and say, no, for me, being the first is the most important. And so I think the key thing is to decide so that you have a North Star. And so for, for us, uh, people have, some people have forgotten this now, but Apple didn't have the first MP3 player. The iPod was not the first one. It was the first modern one. Apple didn't have the first smartphone. It was the first modern one. And Apple didn't have the first tablet. As a matter of fact, Microsoft was shipping tablets decades before. Nobody used them because they weren't any good. But, but they did it, right? And, and so for us, for us, our North Star is making the best products that really enrich people's lives. And if we can't do those, we pass. And it doesn't bother us that we are second, third, fourth, or fifth if, it, if we still have the best. It doesn't, we don't feel embarrassed because it took us longer to get it right. Um, now sometimes, sometimes the sun and the moon line up and you can be the best, the first, and have the most. But rarely does that happen, and you should never, ever base success or failure on hitting all three of those, in, in, my, in my view. So as an entrepreneur, I would encourage you to pick one, and then go for it, whatever it is. We have time for two last quick questions. Uh, this next one from Scott Cunningham, a VP at Simplis. How soon do you see augmented reality and virtual reality becoming more fully integrated into our daily lives, specifically in, in the operating systems of mobile devices? How will that change how we interact with both people and businesses? I think there's kind of two different questions there. It will happen, it'll be enabled in the operating systems first, because it's a precursor for that to happen for there be, to be mass adoption of it. And so I've, I've looked for that to happen, you know, uh, in the not too distant future. But in terms of it becoming a sort of mass adoption, so that say everyone in here would have an AR experience, the, the reality to do that is it has to be something that everybody in here views as an acceptable thing. And nobody in here, or no, maybe not no one, but few people in here are gonna think it's acceptable to be tethered to a computer walking in here and sitting down. And few people in here are gonna view that it's acceptable to be enclosed in something. Uh, because we're all social people at heart. Uh, even those of us introverts are social people. We like people and, and we wanna interact. And so I think it has to be in that, that it's likely that AR 
of the two is the one that the largest number of people will engage with. I do think that uh, a significant portion of the population of developed countries and, and eventually all countries will, will, be, will have AR experiences every day. And it will be almost like, um, almost like eating three meals a day. Because it, it will just become, it will become that much a part of you. It's almost like you, a, a, lot of, a lot of us live on our smartphones. You know, they're very important. The iPhone's very important, I hope, for everyone. Um, so AR, I think, is going to become really big. VR, I think, is not going to be that big compared to AR. I'm not saying it's not important. It is important. And I'm very excited about VR from an education point of view. Because I, I think that it can be really big in education. I think it can be really big for games. But I can't imagine everyone in here getting in a enclosed VR experience while you're sitting here with me. But I could imagine everybody in here in an AR experience right now, if the technology were there, which is not today. How long will it take? AR is going to take a little while because there's some really hard technology challenges there. Uh, but it will happen. It, it will happen. It'll happen in a big way. And we will wonder when it does how we live without it. Kind of like we wonder how we live without our phone today. And uh, so it, it will definitely happen. Our last question comes from uh, Senator Hatch. Well, let me just ask at, at Apple, how do you maintain Steve Jobs' spirit of motivation? You know him as well, if not better than anybody. Yeah, I, I love Steve, and we all do. From, from my point of view, Steve will always, his spirit will always be the DNA of the company. He, he embodied uh, who we are. It was his vision that Apple should make the best products. And it was his vision that, that they should enrich people's lives. And the, the other, lots of other things will change with Apple. But that will never change. That, that is sort of the... Is, there's so much noise in the world every day. And, uh, you know, people want us to do this or that or the other thing. We keep our eye on that, and it's amazing doing that, and that's his spirit. It, it makes a lot of decisions easy, because it becomes easy to say, no, we're not going to do that one. That's not the best, and it doesn't enrich anybody's life. Or, yeah, that's a cool product, but nobody's really going to get anything out of it. So let's don't do that one. And so that, that spirit of him and that... The uh, feeling that he always had of not accepting the status quo, sort of the rebel, that is still very much the heartbeat of the company. And the, the feeling that good isn't good enough, that it has to be great, that it has to be insanely great, uh, that, that spirit still permeates. And you can still feel him in there. You know, as I showed you when you were out, uh, I've kept his office uh, with all of his stuff in it. He still has an office there. And, and I think that's important because, uh, because I, I really want that, his legacy, to be with Apple 10 years from now, 100 years from now, 1,000 years from now. Not for Apple to be constrained by it. So we're not thinking, what would Steve do? We're not thinking that. But we're, but we're very much married to his vision of making the best products that enrich people's lives. And that doesn't change. All right, thank you. I've had the pleasure of uh, knowing Senator Hatch for several years now. Uh, 
we are all better off because of his hard work on whether it's tax reform or encryption or intellectual property protection. Uh, he does great work for the people of Utah and for America. making such a difference in this IT world and who has been so gracious as to come up here and spend some time with us in this meeting as well as our dinner that we're going to have here. So I'm really grateful for Tim. It was, it was a real sacrifice to come, but we're really grateful to have him here at Utah.